The Abbasid Caliphate has crumbled. The vast Islamic empire that once stretched from India to Spain has now been fragmented. Spain is beyond Abbasid control. Egypt is taken over by the Fatimid dynasty, and the northern frontiers are under Seljuk control. Even part of the Levant and the Holy Land are now lost to the Christian Crusader forces. The unification of all the Muslims under one banner is now a dream long gone. But still today, we talk about this era with great interest, as one of the most important turn of events in history. The influence of this era still shapes the idea of chivalry and glory in popular culture. Films are made, books are written, comics and games are created. From children to adults, people still reminisce about those days. Even after almost 800 years, the legends of this era influence the geopolitics of the Middle East. And all these are mostly because of the work of one single man, Salahuddin, the righteous. He was the last great sultan of the Abbasid Caliphate. More than that, he was the last sultan who had a dream and dared to make it a reality. The dream of a unified Islamic force the dream of reinstating the legacy and honor of the Caliphate, the dream of a free Jerusalem, free from the Crusaders. Yet, Salahuddin did not have one swift victory after another, like any other great conqueror. He tried, he failed, he persisted, and learnt from his mistakes, and came back stronger. He was bold, dutiful, and intelligent, yet his reign was filled with setbacks, treachery, and disappointments. That is why Salahuddin is so beloved. He is not like a hero from ancient mythology with superpowers. Rather, he is more of a human, flesh and bone. He is a hero not because he was the chosen one, rather because he was courageous enough to be one. He chose himself to become the one. As we dive into his life in the next couple of weeks, we will see how this hero was forged in hardship and courage. In the year 1149, a young boy of ten named Yusuf ibn Ayyub was playing in the yard of his home. Suddenly, he heard a call from the minaret of the mosque. The Zengid Sultan, Nur ad-Din Zengi, has returned victorious after a decisive battle with the Crusaders in Edessa. Edessa is now part of the Islamic Zengid dynasty. Hearing this news, people flood the streets in victory procession. The bravery and praise of Nur ad-Din is on everyone's tongue. Young Yusuf joins the rally as well. This event will have an everlasting effect on his young mind. Fighting the Crusaders and bringing back the lost glory of the Muslims will set the course of his life. Young Yusuf will grow up one day to be recognized as Salahuddin. At the age of 15, Salahuddin moved to Damascus with his family to complete his study. Damascus was then the capital of the Zengid dynasty, seat of Nur ad-Din. Salahuddin joined a madrasa in Damascus. We can think of a madrasa like a high school in the modern era. Salahuddin started learning about geometry, algebra, geography, as well as the Quran and other fields of Islamic study. At the same time, he was taken under the mentorship of his uncle, Asaduddin Shirku. Shirku was a general under Nur ad-Din. He was a man of solid build, a battle-hardened warrior. He lost one of his eyes in a battle and so used to wear a patch. This made him an imposing character. Under the mentorship of Shirku, Salahuddin started learning about military tactics and swordsmanship. After completing the training, Salahuddin joined Shirku's battalion and entered regular military service in the Zengid army. The time has come for Salahuddin to be of service to his childhood hero, Nur ad-Din. Meanwhile, in Egypt, a power struggle has erupted between two viziers of the Fatimid Caliphate. The Fatimids were a Shia dynasty and the Abbasids were Sunni. Sunni and Shia are the major two denominations of Islam. 
Historically, the two dynasties are rivals of one another. Anyway, back to Egypt. The two viziers trying to capture the de facto rule of Egypt were Sharwan and Dirgam. Sharwan was driven out of Egypt by his rival Dirgam. Sharwan asked for help from Nur ad Din. So, in 1163, Nur ad Din sent in an army under the command of Shirku to Egypt. Salahuddin also joined the army under his uncle's command. Salahuddin did not play any major role at this point, but the events that are about to unfold will be his first real lesson in military tactics and politics. So, we'll look into these events to understand how the stage was set for Salahuddin. With the help of Shirku's military prowess, Sharwan was reinstated as the Grand Vizier of Egypt. Shirku garrisoned his army near Cairo to support Sharwan's rule, but as time passed, the presence of a Sunni army in the heartland of the Shia dynasty started creating political friction in the Fatimid court. Sharwan was under great pressure to drive the Zengid army out of Egypt, but he himself had invited them, and without the support of this army, it would not be possible for him to hold on to power. So Sharwan started shopping for a new ally. Between the border of the Fatimid Egypt and Zengid Levant sat the kingdom of Jerusalem, a crusader state under the reign of the Amalric. Sharwan established a secret alliance with Amalric and plotted to attack the Zengid army from both sides. Shirku and his army were stationed in a palace called Bilbis. They were attacked by Amalric from the northeast and by Sharwan from the southwest. This betrayal put the Zengid army in a critical situation. They were not strong enough to break through the lines of the Crusades to retreat to Syria. Neither could they fall back to Cairo because of Sharwan's betrayal. Seeing no other option to save his army, Shirku sent a message to Nur ad-Din for aid. Nur ad-Din was enraged by the betrayal. He had sent his army in good faith to help his ally in Egypt. But that same ally had now plotted to destroy his army by the help of crusaders. How dare Sharwan betray Nur ad-Din's trust? Yet Nur ad-Din was a clever ruler. He did not act in haste. His main goal now was to save one of his most prominent generals and his force. He couldn't let his army be destroyed by the crusaders. If that meant not taking revenge for Sharwan's betrayal now, so be it. There would be a time later to set the balance straight. Nur ad-Din could not send reinforcement to Egypt for Shirku's aid, as that would take a long time, and he was afraid that Shirku would not be able to hold off the enemy for long. So, he devised a plan to deter Amalric's campaign in Egypt. Nur ad-Din assembled a strike force and attacked the country of Tripoli not related to the current Libyan capital. The country of Tripoli was another crusader state and an ally of Amalric. So, when Nur ad-Din attacked Tripoli, Amalric had to stop his advancement in Egypt and send part of his troops back to defend Tripoli. This gave Shirku a window to move his forces back to Syria and save his army. And he took that opportunity. The Zengid army was safe for now. But Nur ad-Din and Shirku did not forget the betrayal by Sharwan. To plot with the crusaders against fellow Muslims could not go unpunished. They were waiting for the right opportunity. That opportunity came in 1168, when Amalric broke his alliance with Egypt and attacked Cairo. Amalric always had his eyes on Egypt, not only for expansion of his territory, but also for the vast riches of Egypt. The weak rule of Sharwan gave him the perfect chance to attack. Amalric assembled his naval force and sailed toward Cairo through the Nile Delta. Egypt was too weak to defend itself under Sharwan's rule. So the Fatimid Caliph, Al-Adid, begged Nur ad-Din to come and rescue Egypt. This was the moment that Nur ad-Din was waiting for. All these years of waiting in patience for the sweet taste of revenge had finally paid off. If they'd entered Egypt now as a liberating force, they would have the support of the people of Egypt to depose Sharwan, and as a bonus, they would also be able to defeat the Crusaders in yet another battle. So, the Zengids under the command of Shirku marched into Egypt. Salahuddin joined the expedition as well, this time as the commander of a battalion of the army. The Zengids and the Crusaders came face to face at a place called Al-Babain, 
west of Giza, near the desert border of the Nile. The Zengids chose this location intentionally for a strategic advantage which would become obvious later during the battle. For the time being, Salahuddin took control of the right wing of the army, and Shirka took the central command. The crusader army was greater in number and stronger in arms than the Zengids, so Shirka and Salahuddin started discussing a battle strategy to make those advantages of the crusaders ineffective. They came up with a clever plan. Salahuddin would impersonate the central commander of the army and pretend his soldiers were the central contingent. Shirka did not station all of his troops in the battlefield and hid part of them behind the dunes in the desert. As the crusaders did not realize the plan, they charged with full might toward the Zengid central force. This was the moment Salahuddin had been preparing for all of his military life. If he couldn't defeat the enemy with sheer strength, he would do it through strategy. As planned, Salahuddin staged a feigned retreat. He commanded his army to fall back into the desert. The crusaders chased Salahuddin and fell right into his trap. The heavy cavalry of the crusaders lost their advantage in the steep and sandy terrain. They could not move quickly, whereas the lighter Zengid cavalry could move much faster on the same terrain. So the early advantage of the crusaders was lost. Their lines broke down and the battle was fragmented into smaller skirmishes rather than a concentrated central attack. Shirku was waiting for the exact moment. He took his reserve force and returned to the offensive, and at the same time, Salahuddin turned back with his force and launched a counterattack from the other side. Stuck between the dual offenses, the Crusader army was completely crushed. This was the first sign of Salahuddin's military genius, his first taste of victory against the Crusaders. From now on, Salahuddin is no more a bystander, he now has an active role to play. The young boy, inspired by the tales of defeating the Crusaders, is now capable of defeating the Crusaders on his own. Join us next time as we explore the early years of Salahuddin's administrative and military career, how he becomes the Grand Vizier, protects Egypt from yet another Crusader attack, strengthens the nation, and eventually becomes the Sultan of Egypt. Salahuddin Part 2 Shifting Tides The main streets of Cairo. People are gathered on both sides to celebrate the victory of the Muslims against the Crusaders. The victorious Zengid army is marching toward the royal palace of the Fatimid Caliph. People are screaming with joy and showering the soldiers with flowers. At the head of the marching army is the general Shirku, and just behind him rides Salahuddin, the young hero, head held high with pride and and honor. But little does he know what is about to unfold in the coming months. Once Shirku and his commanders reached the Fatimid court, the Caliph Al-Adid greeted them with great joy and generosity. He offered Shirku the role of the Grand Vizier of Egypt. Shirku took this offer without hesitation, but he hasn't forgotten about the betrayal of Shaur. And he knew perfectly well that if he lets Shaur free, he will plot to strike back again. So Shirku's first command was to arrest Shaur and execute him. It was also a warning to everyone. Anyone who dares to side with the Crusaders will only meet one end. Death. Shirku was a man who enjoyed food and frequently arranged lavish feasts for his guests. On one such occasion, after feasting on a large meal, Shirku fell ill. The illness soon proved to be fatal. Shirku died only two months after he became the vizier. Salahuddin lost his beloved uncle and trusted mentor. Now he had to stand on his own without Shirku's support and guidance. As Salahuddin mourned the death of his uncle, Shirku, the leaders or emirs of different factions and military groups from both the Fatimid side and the Zengid side started arguing about who would be the next vizier of Egypt. The Fatimids wanted a weak vizier, so that he could not gather much political influence. Electing a strong Sunni vizier wouldn't show particular strength of the Shia Caliphate, whereas the Zengids pushed for a strong leader as the vizier, so that they can have a solid influence on the Fatimid Caliphate and its inner politics. The arguments went on for days. Then, one day, a messenger arrived at the court. He brought a letter from Nur al-Din, 
In that letter, Nur ad-Din recommended Salahuddin as Shirku's successor and requested Caliph al-Adid to appoint Salahuddin as the vizier. After all, Salahuddin's family had been of great service for many years to both Nur ad-Din and al-Adid. The Fatimid emirs supported this nomination as they thought Salahuddin was young and inexperienced. They thought he would easily fall in the role of vizier. On the other hand, the Zengid emirs saw Salahuddin's leadership on the battlefield and believed they could put trust in his abilities. So they agreed to the proposal as well. As a result, Salahuddin became the de facto ruler of Egypt, the Grand Vizier of the Fatimid Caliphate at the age of 30 in early 1169. Salahuddin had never had such power and independence before. But he was still in a tug of war between the Fatimid Caliphate and the Abbasid Caliphate through Nur ad-Din. And as we have discussed before, these two caliphates, one Shia and the other Sunni, were never on friendly terms. So Salahuddin now had the problem of split loyalty. As the vizier, he owed his loyalty to the Fatimid Caliphate in Egypt. At the same time, as the general of Nur ad-Din, he owed his loyalty to the Zengid dynasty and thereby to the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad. This actually made it very difficult for Salahuddin to do what he wanted to do, help the people unite the people, and free the Holy Lands from the Crusaders. Soon after his appointment as the vizier, the internal political conflict in Egypt started to weigh heavy on Salahuddin. He tried to focus his mind on rebuilding the Egyptian nation. He commissioned several hospitals and madrasas, which are kind of like universities by modern standards. He started investing in improving infrastructure and defense of major Egyptian cities. One evening, Salahuddin was busy in his study thinking about his plan for the nation, when there was a sudden knock on the door, followed by several loud knocks. Salahuddin ordered the person to come in. It was Ali bin Sufyan, the chief of his bodyguards. He brought grave news. Some emirs of Egypt had decided to stage a revolt and assassinate Salahuddin in the dark of the night. Salahuddin suspected that he would not have the full support of the emirs of Egypt, who did not like a Sunni vizier, under the Shia Fatimid Caliphate, but he never expected that they would plot to kill him. Salahuddin was saddened. He had just started a few months ago. What had he done to deserve such treachery? But he had to control his emotions. He had to act fast before the rebels could strike first. He ordered his own bodyguards to capture the main conspirator, a high official for the Fatimid Palace. He was immediately arrested and executed. Yet it was not sufficient to completely stop the rebellion. The following day, several other Fatimid emirs with almost 50,000 soldiers started a revolt in different parts of Egypt. Salahuddin now had a civil war on his hands. As the civil war continued, the number of the wounded and the corpses piled up. After several months of fighting, the rebel emirs started to fall one after another. It took Salahuddin almost six months to completely quell the uprising. No mercy was shown to the rebel leaders. They either fell in battle or were executed. It was a hard lesson for the Egyptian emirs. Never again would anyone dare to rise against Salahuddin in Egypt. Salahuddin's swift and resolute actions saved Egypt from a long and bloody civil war. And he learned his lesson well. He started to rebuild his court, appointed trustworthy family members and friends in important roles of state. Besides this, he also started appointing people based on their skills and merits and not because of their lineage and influence. This way, Salahuddin gradually created a strong and trusted inner council of his own. This solidified Salahuddin's political position in the Fatimid court. Now he could again focus on rebuilding the nation. Hardly three months had passed in peace, then disaster struck again. Towards the end of 1169, the crusader states of the Byzantine Empire joined forces and sent a massive naval fleet to invade Egypt. They were approaching fast to attack an Egyptian port city, Damietta. Salahuddin had actually been working to strengthen the fortification of different parts of Egypt since he came to power, expecting an attack from the crusaders. But he did not expect the attack to come from the Mediterranean Sea. He thought the crusaders would invade on land through the Sinai Peninsula, as they had done before. So, Salahuddin's main defense force was stationed much further south than Damietta. This meant it would take some time to send reinforcements to the port city. So, he had to find a way to delay the invasion. 
he sent a messenger to the governor of Damietta asking him to block the entrance from the sea so that the naval fleets could not come inside the defensive line. He wrote to them that the reinforcements were already on their way. Simultaneously, he commanded his army to march towards Damietta. Upon receiving news from Salahuddin, the defenders in Damietta strengthened the city defense and raised an iron chain across the city's branch of the Nile. This prevented the crusader ships from entering the harbor from the sea and launching the attack. The crusaders decided to blockade the city from the sea. This is exactly what Salahuddin anticipated. He could now send supplies easily to the city through the Nile and reinforcements could reach the city from the southern side without confronting the enemy. The crusaders realized they couldn't take the city as easily as they had thought. They began regular siege tactics and started deploying siege weapons to attack the city defense. They built catapults, siege towers, and ballistae. But the defenders of Damietta were able to defend one wave of crusader attack after another. This was possible as they were getting regular supplies of food, arms, and men. From time to time, the defenders even went offensive to put pressure on the crusader front lines. On one occasion, they even sent a fire ship down the river into the Byzantine fleet. As soon as it reached the fleet, the explosives stored inside the fire ship detonated, causing a huge explosion. Six Byzantine warships were completely destroyed, and several others were damaged beyond repair. On several occasions, the defenders also rallied outside of the city walls, attacking the siege lines and destroying the siege engines that were pounding on the city walls. After several weeks of failed attempts to capture Damietta, the crusaders started to run out of food and other supplies. Their plan to launch a swift and surprise attack on Egypt had utterly failed. There would be no way now to continue the invasion without suffering huge casualties. The war would drain their treasury dry, and the riches that they had planned to plunder from Egypt were now out of reach. So after almost two months of laying siege on Damietta, the crusaders decided to withdraw and leave Egypt. Although the battles at the siege of Damietta were not as intense as other invasions by the crusaders, the failure of combined Byzantine and crusader forces to take a single Egyptian port city was actually a heavy blow to the morale of the crusaders. This victory proved Salahuddin's capable leadership. It would be another five years before Egypt faced another external threat. Salahuddin now had the resources and support in Egypt to continue his master plan. Join us next time as we explore further consolidation of Salahuddin's power in Egypt and his struggle to unite the Muslim nations under one banner against the Crusaders. Stay tuned. Salahuddin Part 3 The Sultan in Action Cairo, Egypt. Two years since the Crusaders had to retreat from Damietta. It has been a peaceful time, and Salahuddin has used the time to strengthen Egypt. The economy improved, the army grew bigger and stronger. The defenses of major Egyptian cities were rebuilt. Salahuddin even went on the offensive against the Crusaders by sending troops to attack the border regions. Everything was going according to plan. Then suddenly, the Fatimid Caliph in Cairo fell gravely ill. As he had no designated successor, Egypt was up for grabs. After two centuries of Fatimid rule, seismic changes were about to take place. Quick action was necessary to prevent the power vacuum in Cairo from undoing all the work of Salahuddin so far. Moreover, Salahuddin was under immense political pressure from Nuruddin and the Caliph in Baghdad to establish Sunni dominance in Egypt. And Salahuddin was the second most powerful person in the country, who was better suited to become the new king of Egypt. Upon the death of the last Fatimid Caliph al-Adid, Salahuddin had now the opportunity to establish his own dynasty. Thus began the Ayyubid dynasty. This was uncharted territory for Salahuddin. He'd always had big plans, but until now he did not have the complete independence and the unmatched power to work on them. Egypt belongs to Salahuddin now, and he has total control of every aspect of it. And so begins Salahuddin's great leap forward. Immediately upon sitting on the throne, he proclaimed the caliph in Baghdad as caliph, and Egypt became part of the Abbasid Caliphate. Salahuddin would be a semi-independent ruler with the title Sultan of Egypt. Salahuddin was still theoretically under Nur ad-Din's command, and he did not want to damage that relationship. So Salahuddin arranged for a handsome annual tribute for Nur ad-Din, making sure that he had no opponents from the Muslim side 
to challenge his power in Egypt. Once the external support was ensured, Salahuddin focused on his own dynastic ambitions. No doubt the dream of freeing the Holy Lands was always burning inside of him, but he understood that he couldn't launch a campaign against the Crusaders unless he established a powerful empire in Egypt first. Salahuddin turned the wheel of change in Egypt. His council revised the tax codes, ensuring further revenue of the state, redistributed the lands, ensuring royalty at local leadership levels, replaced the corrupted provincial officers with skilled officers, ensuring effective administration of the state and less chance of conspiracy against the Ayyubids. Salahuddin showed everyone that when it comes to being a sultan, he had his own way of doing things. Syria under Nur ad-Din and Egypt under Salahuddin provided a perfect opportunity to attack the Crusader state kingdom of Jerusalem from two different sides. A plan was drawn out. Both Nur ad-Din and Salahuddin started marching from their own capitals. But halfway to the battleground, Salahuddin returned to Cairo. Nur ad-Din found himself alone on the battlefield. He continued on with the assault, but ultimately the campaign was not successful. Until today, we do not know for sure why Salahuddin turned back. He wrote to Nur ad-Din about the possibility of a rebellion in Cairo in his absence, which many scholars argue was not a good enough reason. But what we know for sure is that this event caused a divide in the trust between Nur ad-Din and Salahuddin, and over time, this divide would only grow bigger. Although disappointed, Nur ad-Din was content with Salahuddin for the time being. He was still receiving the tribute from Egypt, However, Salahuddin's not showing up initiated a lot of rumors and conspiracy theories in the Zengid court. In general, it was seen by the Zengid emirs as Salahuddin's defiance of Nur ad-Din's command. In the meantime, Salahuddin was busy in Egypt. The steps he initially took after coming to power started bearing fruits. His army fought skirmishes in the southern and western boundaries of Egypt, launched a campaign against Yemen, and established a strong naval presence along the Red Sea coasts thereby extending Salahuddin's control to Sudan, Mecca, Medina, and Yemen. Both his treasury and his political influence were enriched by these missions. Salahuddin won the heart and trust of the Egyptians, and people were ready to support his cause. But the more Salahuddin grew in power, the more mistrust and friction occurred between the Ayyubids and the Zengids. Eventually, the Zengid emirs were able to convince Nur ad-Din that his once deputy had now become too powerful and needed to be removed. In 1174, Nur ad-Din started preparing his army to invade Egypt, and Salah ad-Din began preparations to defend it. But during the preparation, Nur ad-Din suddenly fell ill and passed away after only a few days. Nur ad-Din's successor was his son, Saleh, only 11 years old. The news of Nur ad-Din's death reached Salah ad-Din. Undoubtedly, the death of his childhood hero and mentor had a massive impact on his state of mind. Although they were not on friendly terms at the time of his death, Salahuddin always had a great respect for Nur ad-Din for his effort to unite the Muslims of Syria against the Crusaders. Yet Salahuddin was relieved to some extent, knowing that the civil war between Syria and Egypt would now be avoided. That night, Salahuddin went to the balcony of his quarters. As he looked towards the horizon beyond the vast expanse of his capital city, all the mixed feelings and thoughts regarding Nur ad-Din's death unfolded in his mind. Not only did this impact his personal feelings, the news had also major political implications. Nur ad-Din's death changed the entire geopolitical dynamic of the region. Surely, the young son of Nur ad-Din wouldn't be able to practice the same power his father did. The power vacuum would create infighting among the Zengids. What actions should Salahuddin take now? To drive the Crusaders out of the Holy Lands, the existence of a strong Syria is essential. Without strong fronts in both Egypt and Syria, the ultimate victory against the Crusaders cannot be guaranteed. And without Nur ad-Din, Syria does not have that strength any longer. Should Salah ad-Din launch a campaign against the Crusaders on his own? Perhaps, but if Syria fell into the wrong hands, then the Crusaders could form a new alliance and outmatch Salah ad-Din's force. Should he then annex Syria first to prevent that? He could, but the values and Islamic teachings that he grew up with prevented him from doing so. He can't wage war against the family of his benefactor without any provocation. That would be hypocrisy for him, making him unsuitable to lead the armies in the Holy Lands according to his own standards of belief. 
Certainly, Salahuddin was an ambitious man, but his ambition was not more important to him than his principles. He knew in his heart that if he wished to be successful in freeing the Holy Lands from the Crusaders, he had to do it in an honorable way. No political backstabbing and betrayal should be allowed to tarnish his lifelong goal. As the dawn broke and the call for prayer was announced from the minarets of the Grand Mosque of Cairo, Salahuddin could finally make up his mind. He decided to wait and not get involved in the political turmoil in Syria for the time being. His lifelong mission for the Holy Lands was put on pause. A few days later, a messenger reached Damascus with a letter from Salahuddin to as Saleh. The Sultan of Egypt had promised full support to the young prince and would always come to his aid whenever it was needed. As Salahuddin's letter reached Damascus, another message reached Salahuddin's court in Cairo. Egypt was under attack. A naval fleet of crusaders and Sicilians laid siege on Alexandria, one of the most important cities in Egypt. The attackers had almost 200 warships, 40 transport ships, and more than 1,000 knights. It was a formidable assault. But this time, Salahuddin was much more prepared than on previous occasions. Soldiers and supplies were quickly sent to Alexandria to reinforce the defenders. The initial blow was heavy on the Muslims. All the warships and commercial vessels of the Muslims at the port of Alexandria were destroyed by the Sicilian invaders. But as the reinforcements reached the city, the defenders' morale was boosted. On the second day of the battle, when the invaders brought their siege towers near the wall of Alexandria, the Muslim defenders burst out of the gates in a surprise attack and did their best to hit the enemy's morale. They burnt down the siege towers, ravaged the enemy camps, and took away large amounts of weaponry and treasure. This was a serious blow to the invaders. As the siege dragged on for days, the invaders started to lose strength. They needed reinforcement, but the promised reinforcements never arrived from the Crusader states. That was because King Amalric died suddenly of dysentery in Jerusalem. His kingdom was passed on to his 13-year-old son, Baldwin IV, who was suffering from leprosy. This sudden death of Amalric prevented the Crusaders from sending the promised supplies to the battlefield. Ever the diplomat, Salahuddin quickly initiated a truce between him and the new Crusader king, leaving the Sicilians alone to fight in the battle. Simultaneously, Salahuddin started marching towards Alexandria with a huge army. The Sicilians had to accept the defeat. What could have been the biggest threat to Salahuddin's reign actually brought yet another victory through his military and diplomatic prowess. But all the news was not good. Back in Syria, the young prince Asale became a pawn in the fighting among top Zengid leaders. The prince was in Aleppo, and the emir of Aleppo Gumushtigin wanted to use his guardianship over the prince to establish his own political influence in Syria and kill the other emirs in the region, starting with Damascus. A political rival of the emir of Aleppo was Saif al-Din, the emir of Mosul. But he refused to come to the aid of Damascus when requested. So seeing no other way, the emir of Damascus had to ask support from Salahuddin. This request gave Salahuddin the legitimacy to get involved in the power struggle in Syria. But Salahuddin had to act quickly. There was no time to assemble a large army and spend several weeks marching towards Syria. He took 700 of his best horsemen and rushed towards Damascus. To save time, he even went through crusader territories Karak and Shubak. Although a very risky maneuver, it proved fruitful. Salahuddin traveled so quickly through the enemy territory that the crusaders could not do anything about it. In the end, Salahuddin reached Damascus even before Gamushtigin's army started marching on the city. This was a brilliant move by Salahuddin, as Damascus now came under his control without any serious resistance. It saved plenty of time, resources, and bloodshed. The people of Damascus welcomed Salahuddin with open arms as their protector. After establishing his base in Damascus over the next few days and gathering more local force, Salahuddin quickly moved towards Aleppo, laid siege on the city, and demanded the guardianship of the prince As-Saleh. One dark night during the siege of Aleppo, while Salahuddin was discussing plans with his emirs in a private tent, someone rushed into the tent from the darkness. He was dressed in black and had a bare knife at his hand. He jumped onto Salahuddin in an attempt to stab him with the knife. This was Salahuddin's first encounter with the secret cult called the Assassins. So far, we have seen Salahuddin rise in power and win one victory after another. As we further explore the events of his life, 
we'll see a new chapter unfold, a chapter full of struggles, stalemates, and challenges, a period in which Salahuddin spends most of his time and effort fighting his fellow Muslims rather than the Crusaders. Oh,